right. Welcome to our first Ecology Center Seminar of the Year. Woohoo! And it is my pleasure to announce our first speaker for the seminar series this year, and that is Dr. Zhao Ma. Um, many of you, or some of you in the room, probably not many anymore, um, but some of us in the room recognize Dr. Ma from her time here at USU, where she started her uh, illustrious career as a faculty member. Um, however, about 13 years ago, she moved to Purdue University and is currently a professor of natural resource social science there. So uh, a lot of promotions in that time. That's fabulous. Um, before she was a professor, um, she did the track that most of you are either in the process of doing or have done in your life. She started as a undergraduate getting a bachelor's degree at University of Science and Technology in Beijing. Then she moved to a master's at Brandeis University and then did her PhD at University of Minnesota um, and then completed a postdoc in forestry at U University of Massachusetts. Um, her research, as you will hear about from her, it combines quantitative and qualitative data to study decision-making processes for natural resources. Um, Dr. Ma does really absolutely great research. She's a hilarious and wonderful person and great scientist, and I'm excited for her talk. And that's exactly, yeah, this is where I started my career, right, so as a faculty member. So it's very, very nice to be back. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also very excited to be invited by the Ecology Center. Normally, it's me chasing ecologists and telling me them what I have to say. But this time, I feel very honored and uh, humbled that I'm, you know, actually being asked what I have to say. So trust me, I have a lot to say. So we'll see how far we go. All right, so disclaimer, I just got back from field in Bolivia um, on Saturday night. So I'm still a little bit disoriented. I would like to be more prepared than I am now, but you get what you get, right? And we don't complain. Okay, so here we go. Um, so for today, I'm not gonna go too deep uh, into a particular area of my research. Instead, I'm gonna give you an overview of my research program because I think a lot of grad students here might be interested in kind of looking at the bigger picture and also pick two particular research projects as an example to demonstrate some of the points I want to uh, come across and for you to take home with and then uh, share with you a few concluding thoughts. Um, so first thing first, who am I? Uh, I ask myself that question from time to time. I am an interdisciplinary environmental social scientist, which means I apply, I use and apply different social science theories and approaches to study human environmental interactions. And a lot of the work I've done so far have been focusing on understanding how individuals and organizations make resource and environmental conservation decisions in the context of social ecological change. That change context is very important to me, right? So when I talk about social ecological change, that could mean a uh, big scale climate change, right? It could mean um, the invasion of non-native species coming into a system. It could mean uh, a demographic shift in the population of resource users. It could mean uh, migration, right? Labor migration. And in that context, what happened in terms of resource management, right? So a lot of uh, um, the work I do is really um, situated in that context of change. Um, another thing that's important to me, and you probably will, will see very soon, is a lot of my work is very much collaborative in nature, right? So I work with a lot of other social scientists, uh, biological, uh, ecological scientists, engineers, and more recently trying to learn and work with humanity scholars as well, right? So for me, to address social ecological challenges, that collaborative interdisciplinary work is really, really important, right? So that's sort of uh, uh, where I came from. Um, if you zoom into my research program, it's uh, all over the place. I can't stay focused, and that's partly why I just work in all sorts of situations and in different places. 
But generally, they uh, fall into three areas, interconnected areas of research. One is really focusing on natural resource decision making. The second area is more about adaptation to social ecological change. And the last area is really developed in the last 10 years, more focused on the uh, intersection between conservation and development. Um, so today, I will briefly talk about two examples uh, from my program. And then tomorrow, if after today you still have the, 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 the interest in come tomorrow I will talk about um, a project in Bolivia, kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, this is kind of uh, the places I've worked and my students have worked. So it's again, all over the place. And uh, despite the wide range of topics and the geographies, everything again is organized under the context of uh, uh, decision-making in, um, um, to address social ecological change. Last disclaimer before I move on to talk about a more specific research program is in this seminar, you probably will hear I say we a lot, right? So by we, I mean my students, my collaborators, uh, my teams, right? So nothing I've done is possible without the great members of my human dimensions lab, right? So I want to um, really give a shout out to all these brilliant people up there and these three, um, Jamie, Seth, and Maury were actually my grad student here at USU um, many years ago, right? So it's, uh, it has been a privilege to learn from these people and work with these people. Okay, so um, let's switch gear and think a little bit about the field, the broad field of the environment, environmental conservation, natural resource management. If we look around the world and looking at all different kinds of programs out there, right, they're generally following four models. One model is that, you know, people don't know how important the environment is, so let's educate them, right? And another model is people are too poor or they don't have the, the, the resources to adapt, uh, adopt the conservation practices, let's pay them. Right. Another model is that people need a more efficient or effective tools to conserve energy, save water, uh, do better irrigation. So let's give them technology. And the last model is very often um, around the idea of capacity building. Right. So people don't know how to transition their livelihoods to a more sustainable a matter, people don't know how to work with each other, so let's train them, right? So if you really think about a lot of the environmental natural resource programs out there on the ground, they tend to follow one of these four models or combination of these models, right? And I'm not saying these models are completely wrong, they all have their own merits, right? But I would say um, there are two they're, they're problematic from my perspective for two reasons. One is this type of thinking tend to lead this us versus them, right? So there's a research participants and researchers, there's resource users and resource professionals, right? But this kind of a dichotomy, this kind of binary description, it's a first, not very accurate, second, not very helpful to describe relationship on the ground, right? And it very often creates this kind of a, a one-way communication or top-down approaches in resource management, which we all know have been shown repeatedly, just are not very effective over time, right? The second problem about these kind of uh, models is that um, by focusing on these four areas, we tend to, um, um, ignore a lot of alternative or additional motivations, factors, barriers, or opportunities that may be very important for shaping people's attitudes and interactions with the environment, right? So without paying attention to these additional or these alternative factors, we may risk, um, you know, miss, uh, miss uh, understanding what's going on, mischaracterize what's going on, misinform conservation programs, right? So I'm going to use two examples from my research program to demonstrate this point, right? To really show alternative factors and, and uh, um, considerations are probably really important for us to uh, promote kind of more sustainable, more resilient human environmental interactions. So the first project I will talk about is about invasive plant management in forest ecosystems. Again, uh, a lot of collaborators is a, you know, an area of my research has, um, you know, been happening in the last 10 years. A lot of the work I will share today is really based on Maisha Clark's work, a former student of mine who is now assistant professor at the University of Florida, right? So I want to give her a shout out, even though she's not listening, but still, I should give her a shout out for the, the, the brilliant work she did. Um, this is a map showing you the 
invasion, mag the magnitude of invasion in forest ecosystems is made, uh, I don't have the skill to make maps like that, honestly. It's made by a colleague of mine from Purdue and basically showing you uh, the, the level of invasion of a forested plot in the United States, right? So where I am in the North Central region, about 52% of sampled forested plot have been invaded by at least one invasive species, invasive plant species, right? So it's a pretty serious situation. Here in Utah, I think it's actually better, but in the Eastern United States, definitely this is a pretty um, considerable concern among ecological communities. Um, I probably don't need to preach to this audience, but there's a lot of ecological impacts associated with invasive plants. One of them is they displace native plant communities, native habitat. They also sometimes change even soil composition. I read about it. I was like, oh, this is fabulous. It, well, it's fascinating, right? How they change the soil chemistry and prevent um, a new generate like regeneration of native species, right? So it's definitely, definitely uh, uh, ecologically uh, concerning. Social economically, it's also a concern for society. Um, it has a cost, right? Invasive plants actually um, have a cost on, uh, you know, induce about uh, 24 billion annual economic losses. Uh, because of the invasive plant, it's also quite expensive to control invasive plants. And also more recently, people are establishing evidence connecting invasive plants and some of the public health concerns, particularly respiratory diseases, such as asthma and other things, right? So it's a, in order to promote a healthy forest ecosystem and also the well-being of uh, human communities dependent on the forest ecosystem, uh, addressing invasive plant management is, uh, is a pretty important, right? So for this research, I focus mostly on um, family forest owners. So for, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term or not, but generally speaking, family forests are forest land owned by individuals and families. And uh, it's uh, basically marked by this light green color. So you can see in the Eastern United States, a lot of these light green colors, which means a lot of uh, family forests, right? And, uh, and in the state where I am in Indiana, we have about 75% forests owned by individuals and families, these so-called family uh, forest owners. The reason I focus on family forest owners um, are three. One is there are just a lot of them, 11 million across the country, holding more than a third of forest resources in the country, that's significant. Second, a lot of uh, private uh, family forest owners are continuing to introduce invasive plants onto the landscape through horticulture practices because the, the states actually don't have a consistent regulation in terms of the use of invasive plants uh, on the landscape. The third reason is really fascinating for social scientists like me, right? Because it's, it's um, invasive plant management is really a social dilemma that requires a collective action. By that, I mean, if you think about any private or public landowner, they could get rid of all the invasive plants from their property. But if their neighbor doesn't do the right thing next year, you know, the invasive plants gonna come back and race spread and regenerate, right? So it really, in order to address this issue, it requires multiple individuals and people across the landscape to work together. And anytime you're talking about collective action, I mean, all the social scientists in the audience, you know, we got excited, right? Getting people together to work together, that nothing gets better than that, right? Um, okay, so in that context, we have uh, three research questions over the years. Today, I will just share tiny little bit of results related to factors influencing individual decision-making, management of invasive plants, as well as uh, collective factors influencing collective action. Uh, very briefly, we use a mixed method research design. So it starts with qualitative interviews to help us inform the development of a survey instrument that we implemented statewide. And afterwards, we did more interviews to kind of follow up, try to help us understand some of the unexpected results, right? So if you're interested in this kind of mixed methods research design, definitely talk to me more about it afterwards. But I just want to kind of briefly mention that. Um, what we found is that landowners are actually concerned about invasive plants, not only on their property, but also on their neighboring property, right? More than a third of landowners are concerned or greatly concerned about um, uh, invasive plants on their nearby properties, right? So um, this is pretty evident in this quote. It, um, I should, uh, I can't see very well there. It reads, 
My husband and I were walking around our property this morning, and I was complaining about the amount of multi-floor rows that we had. I was complaining because we had to start working on it again after I have already worked on it before. As we were walking along our fence line, we noticed our neighbor's property is full of multi-floor rows. And my husband made a good point, which I already knew, which is that it doesn't do us any good because we have a seed source right here. So this really demonstrated how landowners are not only aware of what's happening on their property, but they're also aware what's happening around them and why that is important to them. Right? We also uh, found that a lot of landowners are pretty concerned about a variety of impacts invasive plants could have on their property, mostly related to the beauty of their property, uh, the regeneration of new tree, uh, new tree seedlings on their property, as well as um, the property value and their enjoyment, right? That being said, I do want to emphasize not all landowners think alike, right? There are also plenty of landowner actually um, don't have a huge problem with the invasive plants because as demonstrated in the first quote, they feel they still can use their property the way uh, they intend to use it, um, regardless of the presence of invasive plants, right? And some people actually you, you know, appreciate invasive plants because they serve a, you know, ecosystems, they provide an ecosystem service that may not be important to ecologists or resource professionals, but they are important to the landowners. For example, um, you know, the very thick honeysuckle that could potentially be used as a fence line, right? Delineate property boundaries and it gives privacy, right? So to drive that point home, I want to make us visualize a little bit more by showing you some of these pictures. For ecologists, you look at this, you're like, oh my gosh, all these ecological impacts, we really need to do something about it, right? But if landowner looking at this picture, they see pretty flowers, they see berries for the birds, they see, you know, very cheap, natural grown fence line for, uh, for privacy reasons, right? So not everybody looking at these invasive plants is saying, oh, I need to spend the time and the labor and the money to get rid of them, right? So think about, you know, normally how we work with landowners, we're going to go and tell them how bad the invasive plants are. Therefore, they should actually do something about it, right? But when landowners look at these pretty pictures, they see something differently. And, you know, in a way, by just giving people information and telling them how bad this is for the environment, it's not going to make it. It's not going to make people invest the time and labor and money, right? Um, so, to kind of uh, better understand what motivated people to take action, we uh, developed this uh, empirical model um, is to, you know, kind of looking at the, the people's likelihood to manage invasive plants as a function of a number of factors, right? The perceived the sev sev uh, severity, perceived vulnerability and self-efficacy are three constructs informed by the protection motivation theory, which is a social, uh, psychology theory we're using to inform this particular work. Uh, we also got the normative social influence, which is uh, something my lab has been looking at uh, over the years, both qualitatively and quantitatively. There are plenty of uh, literature documenting how important social influence is in terms of uh, shaping people's resource management and environmental conservation behavior. So we throw that in into the model. There are also your usual suspect, right? The past experience matters, uh, land characteristics matters, land owner characteristics matters, right? So we have this empirical model and the analysis was pretty straightforward. We use the logistic regression to estimate model and here are the results. I know the, 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 the font size is very small, don't worry, you don't have to read any of that. All what you need to pay attention to is this, um, this, this um, which we call it, red square, right? Red, red, red block, right? It's, uh, it shows um, the importance of self-efficacy, right? So if people feel confident in their ability to manage invasive plants, they are more likely to take actions. You will be like, Duh, if I feel confident in doing something, sure, I'm going to do it more. But it's more interesting than that, right? So when we talk about self-efficacy, it's not just like a sense of confidence coming from nowhere, right? It's a confidence that comes from knowing uh, what to do, coming from feeling they have the time to actually invest to address this resource challenge, knowing who in the field they can talk to if they have a problem, 
Um, knowing where to rent the equipment if they want to do something to get rid of some of the hard to get rid of invasive plants. If you know honeysuckle, this is big, thick bushes, right? And if you just have a machete or a shovel, it's going to take you quite a while to get rid of those things, right? So having the right equipment, knowing where to rent the equipment, all of these come together, give people a sense of self, uh, self-confidence, right? This is self-efficacy. So basically it tells us self-efficacy is in fact a multifaceted uh, concept, right? It kind of incorporates multiple um, components. But the question is, how as resource professionals, how as the ecological communities, how do we help people build that sense of self-efficacy, right? This is, self, this is a sense of self-confidence, right? So keep that question in mind. Um, here, uh, another thing I want to mention is this sense of self-efficacy actually have a pretty strong temporal uh, dimension to it, right? Because getting rid of invasive plants, managing invasive plants is not a one-time deal. It requires people to work on it repeatedly, right? And sometimes it can be pretty hard. So there's a first quote, I, I, um, I, I quote, I spend a lot of time pulling garlic mustard, about 10, 15 hours. Now I've read enough about it to realize that I'm emptying the ocean with a tablespoon and you have to be on top of it to keep the seed from coming back, right? So some, you know, it really demonstrates there's a sense of uh, hopelessness, powerlessness, and how much effort people need to do repeatedly, right? So even if people feel pretty confident in doing something, how can we as a resource community keep people's confidence level over time? That's a whole other challenge, right? So some of the forestry professionals have uh, recognized it, um, but you know, it's not universally um, incorporated in how we communicate, how we work with landowners to kind of boost, boost that sense of uh, self-confidence over time, right? It's something important. A second uh, result I want to briefly share is about the importance of a normative social influence, right? So this is a pretty powerful stuff. If you look at it, a one unit increase in normative social influence will double the odds of someone uh, taking actions to manage invasive plants, right? So it is important. And if you look at the behind social influence, what does that mean, right? It's measured as a composite score of three variables, basically telling us, you know, if people um, people care about what their um, identi self-identified peers are doing, right? So if their families and friends and other landowners are working on invasive plants, they would feel more likely or more compelled to also do something about it, right? And this social influence um, variable has been shown repeatedly as very important in the broader natural resource um, uh, um, social science literature. But here we also see, you know, plenty of evidence of the importance of that. Um, but the question is, as a resource community, how do we cultivate a social environment that is actually conducive to invasive plant management, right? How do we cult cultivate this sense of social norms, social, social pressure to make people um, actually take actions, right? Um, if you look at it even you know, more, another aspect with sort of a uh, related aspect we looked at is this idea of working together, right? So when we first did our interviews with key informants, uh, including both some of the larger landowners and also resource professionals, we heard repeatedly like, oh yeah, people in Indiana are very individualistic, they're very independent, they're not going to want to work together, right? They own their land for privacy, they just want to be on their land left alone, do whatever they want to do, right? So you're not going to get people work together. But when we went around to do more interviews and eventually did a survey around the state, that's, we actually learned something quite opposite. A lot of people are very interested in working together. Remember that quote earlier of that woman and her husband walking along their fence line and looking at the multi flower rows in their neighbor's property. They know in order to manage what's on their property, it would be important to coordinate to work with their neighbors, right? But at the same time, our survey results show a lot of landowners don't really know how to work together. They feel challenged by the idea of, you know, just walking up to a neighbor and start talking about coordinating and the cooperation, right? So again, as a resource professional, that's really important for us to think about what are the strategy we can use to actually help promote a social environment where people are more likely to cooperate with each other, to coordinate with each other, right? And that's something um, we learned from this study. So here is a, a quote demonstrating that point. 
um, the person said, in theory, working cooperatively would be better. But in reality, if I waited until my neighbor decided to cooperate with me, nothing would get done. So I just go about it on my own. But if a neighbor expressed any interest in working with me, then certainly, right? Um, so again, this demonstrates the importance of facilitation to help landowner coordinate and cooperate. And this is definitely something that needs to be um, paid attention to by the ecological community and by the resource management community, right? Um, so kind of a take home point from this little study, the very quick summary of like eight years of work. Um, sorry, Maisha. Um, the two, here's are some of the things we learned, right? Family first owners are concerned, not only about their property, but about their neighboring property. Majority of people do have a, uh, do not have a strong sense of self-confidence, but they're strongly subject to social norms, social influence. Uh, and a lot of landowners do recognize the importance and challenges of working together. So as a resource community, right, as an ecological community, I think it's really important to think about how can we help build a sense of self-efficacy, right? Did that, does that mean we need to kind of figure out a mechanism to give landowner periodical, positive, psychological reinforcement? Maybe it's a pat on the shoulder, you know, good job, keep going. Maybe it's to, maybe it's about taking landowners to um, another site to see successful examples of long-term management of invasive plants so that can motivate them to do the same. What, whatever you know, we can come up with, something got to be done there, right? And it really is something I think you know, resource professionals or particular extension folks are very good at getting people adopt a practice, but really being there to sort of provide the continuous support and continuous motivation for people to maintain certain resource management practices. That's a challenge, right? Because we, in our kind of society, we get a check when we, um, you know, I mean, we get a praise when we enroll a new person into a program, but fewer program actually track over time how many of the, the participants of the program actually stay in the program and continue to do um, ecological management, right? So something ought to be changed there in order for um, resource communities to actually play a role to facilitate confidence instead of only telling people this is important, uh, there's an ecological impact, there are social impacts, economic impacts, therefore you should do something about it, right? So that's one point. Um, hopefully you will, I don't have a solution to that, uh, if I do, you know, <laughs> I probably will want some, win some prize, but I don't have a solution to that. But just something for us to think about. The second thing is uh, how to increase forestry professionals' um, willingness and ability to cultivate a social environment conducive to collective action, right? Um, a lot of times that probably require people to actually play the role of community organizers, right? Get community together so they can talk to each other, they can establish trust, that they can see the potential of working with each other, and gradually you gen you you cultivate that 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 social environment, right? But how many of us here are trained or feel comfortable or even willing to play the role of community organizers? I dare say most people entering you know, ecological sciences or natural resource management, they want to, they, 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 they don't want to be organizing, uh, organizing community picnics or, you know, potlucks, right? Um, but if we really want to work with people and, and promote collective action, it is important, right, for, for us to think about how do we train the next generation of scientists and also resource professionals and managers to actually play a uh, social organizer role. Right. Especially, I dare say, in today's society, more and more people are becoming uh, less and less trusting of science and scientists. Right. So if we're just going to people with all the science we have, I don't imagine we're going to go very, very far. Right. It's really get to work with people through that community building capacity um, gave us, at least gave me hope that we can get somewhere. Right. So just something to think about and hopefully um, um, you know, you can continue to have that on the back of your head um, as you work with different communities. All right, so uh, this being said, we are continuing this line of research actually uh, in California. I don't know if Karen, oh, Karen, hey. <laughs> so um, 
we're actually doing some um, um, some of this work now in Sassoon Marsh in California. Uh, a new project, is, I guess it's not new anymore, over a year already. I still want to believe it's new, but it's not that new anymore. But we're trying to integrate both social and ecological data to try to inform an integrated plan, management plan to deal with invasive phagmites in this new landscape. Um, so it's pretty interesting. And uh, again, it involves me uh, and my team talking to private and, uh, and the public landowners. Uh, we're learning a lot from them. If there's opportunity to share with you what we learn in the future, more than happy to do that, but it's sort of ongoing process. I think as we speak, there are landowners taking the survey, right? And then we're still debating yesterday about how to ask some of those questions, right? So social science research is really fun. Um, there are some pictures. We were there visiting people and landowners last September. Um, it's really very fascinating, particularly for me, because I've traditionally worked on landscape that's dominated by private land ownership. But this landscape actually have both private and public, and they have different uh, management goals, utility functions for those of you who are economists sitting in the room, right? So it's it's very interesting to think about how you actually incentivize and uh, facilitate the collaboration between private and uh, and the public entities, especially when the private entities have been traditionally distrusting the public agencies, right? So some continuing work um, in this area. All right. I talk fast and I, I'm excited about this sort of thing. So if anything is unclear to you, feel free to slow me down, ask questions. If not, I'm gonna move on to give you another example, right? So I was thinking before coming here, I thought, oh, I should really get some like dry examples and wet examples so I can cover both the you know, wildland resources and the watershed sciences. But I realized I actually don't work on a lot of wet projects. Maybe that's something I should have. Uh, I should uh, think about in the future. So this is another project on the land. Um, it's uh, a recent, we just finished this project as part of a larger program funded by the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Division of Wildlife, to try to establish an integrated management approach to manage deer, um, deer in Indiana. So we're just a part of the team and my former student, Taylor Stinchcomb, is the brain behind a lot of the work I'm gonna talk about today. She is now a, a scientist working for um, the Wildlife Conservation Society in Alaska. So this is based on her dissertation work. Um, just before I get into the detail of the project, I just want to get us onto the same page, right? So if you look at the human dimensions of wildlife research in the last 30 years, there has been a lot of scholarship trying to identify and measure different cognitive factors shaping people's attitudes and behavior towards wildlife, right? So it's a pretty well established literature out there uh, focusing on wildlife values, beliefs, attitudes, and uh, particular uh, behaviors as well, management behaviors as well. Um, only in recent years, the role of affect, the, the kind of emotions and the cultural meanings become more important to some scholars, right? There's kind of a new wave of scholarship documenting the role of emotions in human wildlife interactions specifically, but also environmental conservation more broadly. But if you look at a lot of this research, a lot of that is really confined to charismatic predators like wolves or bears, right? So it's not very widely um, looked at a topic uh, in human dimensions of wildlife research and in environmental conservation research in general. But I just feel fascinated about the idea, the role of emotions, right? So then I got this opportunity in Indiana to actually um, allow me to look at the role of emotions in the context of the human deer interaction. So it's a really pretty unique um, opportunity here. So white-tailed white deer is very uh, uh, prevalent in Midwest and Eastern United States. In fact, it's also here too, right? This morning, Claudia and I were driving down the hill and then with the deer just right there looking at us, right? So I was like, take a picture, take a picture, Claudia. I was like, ah, oh, it's just another deer. I was like, but I'm from the Midwest, take a picture. Um, yeah, so very exciting, right? And you, you see that sort of thing, they really kind of affect you, uh, uh, you know, your relationship 
with wildlife and later on, you know, thinking about wildlife, uh, wildlife management, right? So in the Midwest, uh, human deer interactions have been typically viewed as example of human wildlife conflicts, right? Very often the result in lethal control of deer population. But anecdotally, we know people have all sorts of uh, attitudes towards uh, our relationship with wildlife, with deer particularly, right? Um, and also research has documented, you know, like society has a very wide range of opinions and, uh, and, and you know, people have wide range of attitudes and opinions and uh, experience with, with wildlife, right? So even, um, um, for you know the same species, right? Different people could feel quite differently about about that particular species. So in my mind, simply treating human deer interaction as a conflict that needs to be resolved would be both inaccurate and unhelpful to address this otherwise quite a complex problem, right? So so in that context is where we started our research. Particularly in Indiana, we don't have a lot of human wildlife interaction type of research. There's almost no research on human deer interactions, despite how important deer population is to the state of Indiana. Um, so when uh, the, the state DNR approached us and they said, we really need to develop this integrated approach to deal with deer because there's a lot of complaints, there's a lot of opinions about how deer should be managed. But first, we don't really know the wide range of opinions out there. Second, we don't really know how to deal with them. So they originally approached Purdue trying to integrate a different kind of uh, ecological data, particularly uh, deer population data, as well as vegetation data to try to inform a more integrated approach, right? But then they realized, well, the vegetation data come from private landowners. So for that to happen, we we'll probably also need to work a little bit with private landowners. To work with private landowners, we need some social scientists who know how to talk to private landowners. So we sort of got roped into the project over time. And then we really, our team really tried to sell to the state DNR. You don't just want us to talk to landowners. You want us to talk to many other members of the public to really gain a more holistic understanding about public perception towards deer and deer management, right? So eventually they were uh, quite receptive of that. And we also told them, sold them idea that you, we, we, if we want to do this right, we need to look beyond just traditional clientele uh, in terms of wildlife management. And in Indiana, that means hunters and farmers, um, but there's also many other segments, groups of the public who are also, you know, possibly invested in the idea of wildlife management. So if you want to have an integrated approach statewide, we probably need to also talk to people who are not hunters and farmers, right? So we got lucky because our DNR was pretty receptive to that message and they gave us funding to talk to whoever we want, right? So that was a party. Um, in that context, we have a, a, a number of research questions, but today I will really focus on um, the role of emotions, right, as, a, as, as my example. Uh, we have a mixed method research design, again, qualitative, qualitative work plus quantitative survey. Um, again, I can talk a lot about, uh, I can talk more about this if you're interested, but in terms of qualitative data, we have uh, data from interviews and also focus groups, and that's Taylor standing there doing a focus group in Bloomington, Indiana. We also have a, a statewide survey that sent out to 6,000 people. And this is everybody like towards the very end of COVID 2021, um, people were in my driveway stuffing envelopes. Um, so that was pretty fun. Um, one of the things we did is really trying to figure out how to quantify emotions. The one thing I want to mention is it's pretty interesting to think about emotions generally, but in order to measure it accurately, it really has to be context specific, right? Because people may have different emotions in different contexts towards the same wildlife species, right? So in this particular case, we worked with the DNR and we figured out four particular um, human deer uh, encounters within which we studied people's emotion. The two is about adult deer uh, eating plants or appearing diseased. And then we also had a one uh, encounter is about a large buck, uh, large buck looking at your way and a baby deer looking at your way, right? So these are four encounters are important. And I will talk a little bit about why that is the case. Um, 
once we got the data, we put everything through a structural equation model. We modeled the role of emotion in mediating uh, general attitudes and, uh, and, and wildlife beliefs affecting people's um, perception in terms of the acceptability of lethal management control towards deer, right? So there's a, a lot of modeling behind it, and we did pretty much the same structural equation model across the four scenarios, and then we compared them across, right? So I'm not going to go into great detail in the method, but again, if you're interested, ask me afterwards. Want to share some results with you. The first thing we found is people have mixed emotion towards deer, right? It's not just a different people have different emotions. It's within the same person, within the same group of uh, 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 actors, people have mixed emotions, right? And it's very interesting because sometimes landowner are get very frustrated about deer because of browsing um, kill a lot of uh, walnut seedling, which is a very valued uh, hardwood tree species in Indiana. A lot of people trying to regenerate that. Um, so among landowners, some people just really don't like a deer. But at the same time with farmers, sometimes we think farmers, generally speaking, they don't like deer. That's what we heard from the state DNR because of crop depredation. But when, I really, when we really talk to them, we found actually mixed emotion. And sometimes the farmer really likes the deer, right? Because that's part of why they live on the landscape and the rural, it's part of the rural lifestyle. So we found a lot of mixed emotions across different groups of uh, people in the state, but also within groups of uh, stakeholders, such as urban residents, um, farmers, landowners, uh, forest landowners, and hunters. Um, we also uh, identified a wide range of factors influencing people's mixed emotions. For example, individual values and beliefs, particularly something that really caught our interest was the, the, the people's concern about deer welfare, right? This quote says, I would never want them to be starving to me, it's terrible to think of a creature starving. So if I have seen a deer that is emaciated, I would feel differently about the deer call, right? So this is actually coming from an interview in a very urban area that has been posing a lot of challenges to the state program, calling program to reduce deer population, right? So in fact, um, uh, we learned this and we thought that was very interesting because this concern for deer welfare could potentially, that emotion, that concern could potentially influence how people think about deer management. Right? Um, the context of deer interactions also matter, uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, when, what, what is a particular interaction you encounter? Did they see a fawn? Did they see a diseased deer? Or um, sometimes we also notice a lot of the social political events, um, you know, happening when the deer issues are being discussed also shape how people feel about deer and deer management. So here are some uh, quotes. This is second one we thought was very interesting. This, this particular individual in the focus group said, I feel guilty even complaining about deer when we have a farmer's market problem with racism. There was something happening in the local farmer's market about racism. Um, there's all the, the kind of a broader, important political, social things going on. And I'm sitting here complaining about deer management. I just feel like, you know, I shouldn't even have the rights to be doing this kind of complaining, right? So people feel really kind of strong emotion, mixed emotion, complex emotion when we talk about resource management, right? So that's something we learned, also very interesting. Um, the last thing we've learned that shapes people's uh, mixed emotion is really political, right? So people talked about the importance of transparency. They talked about, um, you know, the sense of hopelessness and their ability to actually influence decision making um, being uh, particularly important. The power dynamics associated with deer management was highlighted as a, a key factor. So for a lot of the residents who are not hunters or farmers, they have always felt powerless regarding um, whether their voice would have got heard by the state and the local uh, wildlife managers. And they also feel hunters for the most part, but in some cases, the farmers have been prioritized in the state deer management program. So even if they are not necessarily opposed to a particular management approach, but if they think their voice has not been heard, and then the program is actually developed to help only hunters and farmers, they just automatically don't want to support that kind of program. Right. Another thing we heard from people is they um, really feel unhappy about how 
uh, wildlife is being managed in the state beyond just deer, right? Because they see wildlife resources as is a public trust that the state DNR is managing and should be really for all citizens. But the fact that they perceive DNR is prioritizing some voices, some concerns, some needs, and leaving other people's voices out, being untransparent, being unfair, therefore, they're just not going to like state uh, management programs. And that is true for deer, but it's also true many, for many other different species, right? So we heard a lot about people's mixed emotions. We heard a lot about different factors shaping people's mixed emotions. And also from the structural equation model, we learned that emotions play a very important role in mediating some of people's perceptions towards lethal control of deer. So for example, within the human dimensions of wildlife literature, it's pretty well established. If people feel, um, have a generally negative attitude towards a species, they are more likely to um, support lethal control of that species. You think about it, it makes sense, right? However, um, emotion, particularly when people is encountering a fawn, right, like just a little Bambi looking at you, would mediate 14% of the effect attitude have on people's perceptions towards the acceptability of lethal control, right? But when people are, and then you think about if people who really uh, are against the hunting, right, have a negative attitude towards hunting, they are more likely to uh, oppose right, uh, the, the lethal control of deer. But the encounter with a uh, uh, sick deer, right, that kind of emotional response will actually mediate 100% of the effect of attitude have on people's um, perceived accept acceptability of lethal control, right? So we have all these quanti qualitative results, but now we have quantitative results to show really people's emotion are very powerful. It, mediate a lot of the effects that we have previously established in terms of relationship between attitudes, between wildlife values, um, and also uh, people's support or, or, or people's support for different management approaches, right? Particularly in the case of fawns and in the case of sick deer, uh, those encounters are really, really powerful, right? So that lead me to my last, um, summary slide, right? So here are some of the things for the matter of time, some of the things that we've already talked about, the mixed emotion, the role of emotion. Um, but the question is really for wildlife managers to think about how they incorporate the role of emotion in what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So I, when we gave this talk to uh, some of the state wildlife managers, they were like, so uh, when you talk about people's emotion, mixed emotion, diverse emotion, should I just invite more people to come to the wildlife planning meetings? Did that help? Did that address the problem, right? I'm like, well, you know, it helps a little bit, but the whole point is within the same group of people, you could have mixed emotions, right? And people's emotion actually gonna, you know, work out differently under different circumstances, right? So you really need to understand you know, kind of when and wh why people's emotion would play a role and identify those opportunities to, you know, kind of communicate with people. So for example, um, if people understand you're doing a calling program to really help the deer, right? And then you evoke that emotion, people's emotion, people feeling very upset and sad, sadness towards a sick deer. If you could evoke that e emotion and use that to explain and to communicate with people why a deer calling in the urban area is so necessary, it's not for the state you know, whatever reason is really to help the deer, right? You kind of connect with people that way. It's more likely they will be more supportive, at least not to go publicly against your program, right? So even when people hold very strong beliefs about wildlife, emotions can shift attitudes towards management approaches. And this is really something very important. And we talk to state wildlife managers uh, in terms of brainstorming ways to help people more um, connect with uh, or at least be open to try to understand um, emotions from the community members. It's interesting, right? Because you think about in the broad field of science and also particularly in natural resources science and management, 
emotion is such a weird word, right? It's like, oh, emotions. Like we want to stay objective. We don't want to be viewed as emotional, right? But we're actually learning from our research. Emotions are so important. You need to actually connect with people's emotions. And when we tell that to all these local and state wildlife managers, you can imagine the sort of uh, response we got, right? So we had a lot of fun. We're still working on it. And, uh, and it's, of course, I recognize it's much easier said than done, right? I know emotion is important, but if you really ask me honestly, give me recommendation one, two, three, how do we incorporate consideration of emotion in wildlife management? I don't have a very neat answer, right? So it's that's kind of the collaborative piece we're still working on, working on with the state DNR to translate some of this research into actually practical management uh, strategies, right? Okay, all right, so come back to the original slide, right? At the very beginning of this talk, I talked about these four models of uh, natural resource management, environmental conservation programs. And I argued that there are a lot of other factors and considerations that are um, equally, if not more important than just uh, you know giving people information and uh, financial, uh, resources and training. So hopefully by now I use these two examples to at least convince you a little bit about um, the importance of those alternative factors, right? So if you remember nothing, nothing about deer, nothing about invasive plants, that's totally fine. But this last point is really important, right? So the deer uh, project basically demonstrate the role of emotion being very important in shaping people's attitudes and interactions with deer. Um, the invasive plant project really demonstrate the, the self-efficacy and the social norms being very important in shaping people's behavior on the ground, right? So if you remember nothing, hopefully you'll remember this point. It's not just about giving people money. It's not just about educating people. I wish the world is that simple, but it's really never that simple, right? And it is a challenge for all of us to think about these complex social, political, institutional, cultural, psychological factors. And as resource professionals, as ecological communities, how do we think about those? How do we approach those? How do we incorporate some of that consideration in how we train students and train future managers? Um, I'll just leave it, leave it there for you to ponder and hopefully uh, come up with some, uh, some solutions for the future. All right, that's everything I have to say. Thank you very much. All right, we have time for questions. 